Today we're going to talk about something called the ground reaction force. We're going to get back into looking at some of the physics that's involved in martial arts and we're going to try to better understand the role our interaction with the ground plays in, in delivering effective techniques. Now to get started, I want to look at a simple illustration that will help highlight a couple of the important principles that are at play. So I want you to imagine that we have a box that's sitting on the ground. And currently, there are no forces being applied to this box in the horizontal direction. So all the forces are in the vertical direction. That means we have gravity, or the weight of the box, of course, which is pulling it down into the ground. Because the box is in contact with the ground, we know it's not falling through the ground, there has to be a reaction force that's canceling this out, that's keeping it in place. And that's the first piece of understanding the ground reaction force. This is, a, this is a perpendicular reaction force, and it's something that's always present whenever you have two objects in contact with each other. It's something called the normal force. But now to fully understand what's going on here, we have to take this example a step further. So now I want you to imagine, I see this box, for whatever reason, I decide I wanna move the box. So I come along and I apply a horizontal force now to this box. But to my surprise, it doesn't move. It's more massive than I thought it was. So of course, there has to be another force involved here that cancels out my applied force. Well, what is it? Well, let's think about what's going on. I apply the force to the box. The box then applies a, a horizontal force to the ground, and then the ground, of course, by Newton's third law, for every action there's what? An equal and opposite reaction. The ground, uh, therefore, applies a horizontal force to the box. And that particular horizontal force is, of course, called the force of friction. Now, because the box isn't moving, we call this static friction. So I continue to play this game. I push a little harder on the box. It still doesn't move. What happens? This frictional force increases. And we continue to play this game until eventually I reach the, the maximum static friction force, that threshold uh, along which when I break that threshold, now the box is in motion. Well, now you may be saying, okay, well, that makes sense. That's great. But why do I care? How does this apply to our martial arts training? So I have Justin here. And if he gets into a, a fighting stance, is this example not very similar? If I come along and I apply a force on Justin, we know we want to have a stable foundation. We want to understand how to establish our base so that we have maximum stability when met with uh, resistance. Also, we need maximum stability to deliver maximum force because on impact, he's going to be met with a reaction force. Again, this, is, this reaction force very much the same concept. And, and we can highlight how important this principle is. Just imagine Justin standing on skates and he tries to hit me as hard as he can. What's going to happen? He's going to go flying backwards and this impact isn't going to be as devastating as it could be if he had established a proper foundation okay, and hadn't been on skates. All right, so now we understand the importance of this. The next question is then, how do we maximize our stability? And to understand what's going on in, in establishing a strong foundation, a solid base, we have to look sort of inside what's happening here with regards to static friction. Now there's that maximum threshold. So the maximum static friction force is the product of two things. The first is pretty straightforward and we're not going to concern ourselves with it much. The first piece is actually a number you look up in the table. This is called the coefficient of friction. And what this has to do with, which is pretty common sense, see that maximum friction force is affected by the types of surfaces that are in contact with each other. So if Justin's in his fighting stance in this dojo and I apply a force to him, he's pretty stable. If we take him to an ice rink, now he's standing on ice and I apply a force you can imagine he's not going to be as stable. So that's what this first piece is. And it's not something that we can manipulate in the middle of a self-defense situation. So we're just going to accept that this is one of the pieces, one of the components. What's the second piece? This is actually what we can manipulate. Now, some would say it's the weight. And actually, in this specific example, with our current setup, it is exactly the weight that would be plugged in here. 
However, we could change that if we modify this example. Now imagine I'm pushing on this box and Justin comes along. He wants to make my job more difficult and he applies a downward force on the box. The friction force is going to now increase. So what is it that goes here? That's the normal force. That's the reaction force between the two surfaces. Another way that you can illustrate this is just placing your hands together, rub them back and forth, press them together harder, rub them back and forth, and you're going to feel the friction force increases. So it's the reaction, it's that perpendicular reaction force between the two surfaces which ultimately uh, plays a, a role in determining the maximum friction force. And ultimately, this is something that we can manipulate, and it's something that we manipulate on a fairly regular basis within our techniques. So now that we understand that, let's take a look at what's going on in some of our techniques and see how we put this to work for us. One of the first techniques that we teach our students, it's a two-hand choke. And ideally, if, you, if somebody's reaching in to grab you, we teach to step back away from the choke and to poke the person in the throat. Many students, when learning this, they, are, they mess up the timing, and that actually is the critical component to understanding how to manipulate this. It all comes down to timing. And so many students will start poking before they step back or while they're stepping back, or students will step back, establish their base, and then poke. And that's good when you're a beginner. We have to break things down. But when you're more advanced, now you know that if you can maximize the stability of your stance, you can maximize the force that you can deliver into your opponent. And so what's the timing? Well, as you land and impact with the ground, I want you to impact and drop your height and strike all at once. So that's the appropriate timing for that particular technique. And we can reverse that. Instead of moving backwards, we have plenty of techniques where we're moving forwards and then we strike. And as I demonstrated, actually, many will kick and then land and then strike to maximize the effect of this. It all comes down to that timing, land and strike simultaneously. But also keep in mind in this instance, now my body is moving behind my weapon. And if you land and strike uh, consecutively instead of simultaneously, if you mess up that timing, not only are you uh, not maximizing the effect of the reaction force, maximizing your stability, but you're also not making use of that backup mass. You want to strike the instant you're impacting with the ground so that your body is still in motion behind the strike. Now one last example. This time I'm going to be on guard. And Justin throws a punch and I'm going to slip the punch. Now I could slip the punch, move from a neutral position to a forward position and punch him and I get borrowed momentum and that can be incredibly effective. Uh, but what I'm going to do simultaneously, of course, incorporating our body actions to maximize momentum, I'm going to drop my height. Why am I dropping my height? Because yet again, we're manipulating that reaction force. By dropping my height as I impact through your punch, so by dropping my height simultaneously with this, I'm increasing that ground reaction force, I'm increasing the stability of my stance and my ability to to maximize that force. And to test this out, uh, you can get on a scale and you can just play around with the scale. You drop your height, you're going to see that the reading increases when you do that. Or if you slam your foot down like we were demonstrating in the other techniques, you're going to see that, that the, what the scale is reading actually increases. And that's because what the scale is actually reading is the reaction force. That perpendicular reaction force we talked about at the beginning. When you're standing on the scale, you're applying a force on the scale, it applies an equal and opposite force on you, and it's reading that. And if you're in this situation, if you're just standing, there's no additional forces, no ex sudden acceleration, what this reaction force reads is your weight. But you can see by conducting that experiment, it is something you can manipulate, and you can use it to your advantage in many of your techniques. Okay, so that'll be it, I think, for this tip. I want you to keep in mind there are more implications that you can take from this, and we might come back and look at them in a future video. And, of course, there are other principles that are at play while we're uh, performing those various techniques that can also aid in enhancing their effect. Uh, this is just a look, as I said, at 
the nature of the ground reaction force and how we can use it to our advantage. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you soon.